Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I want to believe that we, as we come to you this afternoon from teenager to parent platform, that you are well and uh, relaxed on this Sunday afternoon. And um, yes, we come to you with yet another topic. Remember, we have been, um, we started a while back as you we are responding to the issue of the teenage pregnancies. And um, of course, it is not just that alone that we can respond to. Definitely, there are many other things that would influence even um, our teenagers to engage into sex. Many other things, we've talked about alcoholism, we have heard from a medic, we have heard from a, from a mother, we have heard from teens themselves. And today, being that um, the teenage parent to parent platform is a Christian platform, we definitely would not have missed to bring up somebody who would walk us through using the word of God or how we can use the word of God to give us answers on how we can guide and help our children, younger children, teenage children through this journey about everything that they are coming through in their schools, you know, wherever they are in their neighborhoods, with their peers, because there are many things coming up. As we know, the world is bringing new things every time. And even Western, a lot of Western world has been, we have, we have adopted a lot from the West. And so we cannot say we are not going to talk about that. We're not going to think about that. No, I think we have to embrace where we are at, but then we can't again let the world take over the world, I mean, but we can let the word of God to take over. And so this afternoon, I'm delighted to host Lydia uh, Chola, who has even authored books to do with the, a Christian journey of a teenager. So I'm your host this afternoon, Pauline, and we have our sign language interpreter, Fiona, who is always with us. Thank you, Fiona. And I want to give this chance to my guest to introduce herself as we go on. Karibu. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really honored to be here. Um, my name is Lydia Chola Wayaki. Um, Wayaki is my husband. I'm married. Um, I have one son. He's a teen. And so, um, yes, I have authored books um, and I speak to children, to teenagers, uh, even in different churches I've been sharing. Um, and um, uh, in our church, I'm also an associate pastor there. Uh, every so often, I'm, I'm called to help in one or two things, um, and I do that. So how I began this journey is so interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Lydia, take us. I was about to ask you that after the introduction. So what really, what made you get into this journey of wanting to just understand more, dig more into God's word, and then get to a point of even authoring books and speaking to parents. What led you to that, Lydia? Okay, so I was just your, your regular mom, and uh, I would just go to work, go to church, and just do the normal things that we try to do every day, and to be a good Christian as you know, as God has commanded us. And then um, suddenly, unexpectedly, the Lord started to visit my son, um, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he started to visit him in dreams and in visions. And sometimes he would even see Jesus. He would see him in church. Uh, he would see him touching people. He would see him here at home when we were gathered to pray or to read the word. It was so amazing. I was so shocked. It was the last thing I ever have, could have expected to happen to us. And as a result of that, um, I started to dig into the word of God to see what is it that Jesus is communicating to my son? What is it that he's saying to all of us? Because it couldn't possibly have been about us because it, this testimony is so big. I can't let you in on it today. Mm. And so I kept this diary, and um, that diary became my first book, um, A Journey with Christ. With Christ. Mm. And in this book, I just recorded what it was my son was seeing. And I realized that Jesus is so real. 
and God the Father, the Holy Spirit, they are real. They are so real. And that the Bible is the word of God. Um, and everything in it is true. That reality hit me so much and so hard. And I started to share. In fact, people were looking for us because when they heard about this testimony, they were getting encouraged, especially believers. You know, sometimes you can hit a hard rock and you just think, God is not with me. God is not there. What's happening to my life? But they started to see the reality of Jesus because these testimonies, they were actually coming from children's mouths that Jesus is Lord and he's real. And my son, uh, in fact, it's my son and my nephew who were having these visions. The Lord told them he wanted to use cousins and he had chosen them. And so they would talk of heaven. They would wake up in the morning from these amazing visions and they would say, we saw heaven, we saw many mansions. We saw mansions of gold, we saw the throne room where God sits and you can't see God, he's covered in light. And I looked at all these things I saw there in the Bible. They were talking of Jesus and they were describing him like John the Revelator in Revelation um, 1, 12 to 16. They were saying, mm. shines, he's so brilliant, and he's so kind and loving, and he has marks on his hands and his feet. And uh, this is just the truth of the word, that Jesus died on the cross for us. He loves us, and he wants us. In fact, when they would see him, they would say, when we see Jesus, we feel love and comfort. We just feel it. It just comes to us from him. And indeed, Jesus is love and his comfort and today as we get into these discussions that's where we want you to focus on the word just realize that this god we serve he is really really for real and he is true and he loves you no matter what wow wow so lydia you want to tell me your son at three years four years he would see visions, he would dream dreams, and he would just come and tell you that I've seen the vision of heaven. Yes, mm -hmm. it would happen like that. I can, I can, I can give you one story. Maybe I can tell you the first time Jesus visited him. Yeah. He was, he was in school and the Lord talked to him. <laughs> so he comes home, he's six years old. That's when he had his first encounter. My mm. sister Dan had the first encounter when he was almost four. So mm. he was uh, about six when he had his first encounter. So he comes from school and he's just about to start his homework. And then he remembers. And then he tells me, mom, Jesus uh, talked to me today when I was in school. I was so shocked. I said, Jesus talked to you. How did he talk to you? He told me here in my heart. In fact, when he said that to me, I felt as though he was he was asking me, didn't you know that he talks to us in our hearts? So I asked him, okay, so what did Jesus tell you? He said, first, I wanted to know what he was doing. You know, when you're a parent, you investigate your child. <laughs> I mean, any parent would do that if their child asks, uh, tells you that Jesus talked to them. So I said, what were you doing when Jesus talked to you? He told me, mom, we were, mm. just, we were just in class. And Sorry, we're... we are fluctuating a bit. I don't know whether it's my end. It could be mine. I, I, I'm seated mm. right so that it doesn't bother us. Sorry, sorry, Lydia. I don't know whether it's my end. Mm. I can hear you. Okay, we are a bit. I, I'm seeing like you're frozen. Fiona, are you okay? You can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so I think I, it's inside. I can hear Okay, it's her side. Mm. Okay, you're back, Pauline. I think it yeah, was your side. Sorry, story. I think no. it's my side. I've changed. Sorry about that, Lydia. Yes. Okay. So I was in, I was, as I was saying, I was um, interrogating him and I asked him, um, so what were you doing uh, when Jesus talked to you in class? He said, we, we were just finished our work and I was just seated in class waiting for the teacher. And then I had Jesus here in my heart. And I said, so what did Jesus say? He said, he told me, Mungai, I'm coming to visit you. I want you to see me. 
and I was very shocked. I asked him a few other questions uh, because of time I won't go deep into this conversation. Yeah. Mm. And so I wrote it down. That's how the diary began. I just wrote it down. I just said, you know, God, I believe my child is only six years old and there's no way he can make up this story. But I, I don't know when you're going to visit him. Are you going to visit him when he's 12, <laughs> when he's 10, when he's 15, when he's 20? Let me write and date it so that when it happens, I will remember. Mm. It didn't three days later. Uh, it was a public holiday, 20th. So we we're planning to go and visit my mom and my, my dad, my parents. And so I was just getting him ready so that we could go. And then he, he remembered, he told me, Mom, Jesus was here at night. Mm. It, a little louder, Lydia, please. It was in his room. He pointed at his chest of drawers and he said, Jesus was here at night. And I asked him, how does Jesus look like? And he told me, mom, you didn't know how he looks like. I said, tell me. And he told me, Jesus shines. I saw his hair was white. It was shining. He was wearing something long. It was shining. His eyes were shining. Mom, he was shining so much. All my toys, my room was shining because Jesus was here. And I asked him, are you scared? And he told me, no, mom, you can't be scared when Jesus is there. You just feel love. And uh, he came with an angel and the angel stood at the door with a sword, a sword that had fire on this end of it. It had fire. Mm -hmm. And that was easy. And, you know, after that, I thought it's all done. But the following week, Jesus talked to him again when he was in school. Wow. And Jesus told him, I will show you heaven and I'm going to show you the gold in heaven. And that's how this journey began. And so eternity is real. When we die, there's a place we go. If you believe in Jesus, you will enter heaven. And that's where we need to receive him. We need to love him. We need to walk with him. And um, really, that is what Jesus was trying to tell us. Wow, that's amazing. And now your son is 17 and still walking that journey. I think for the viewers who are listening, because we may not be able to go to that, that the, your first book was actually about that, you know, what your son went through and the encounters and all. And of course, I'll put it up for the viewers. I've actually done that and they can definitely get a copy and listen and just follow through the journey that your son. Okay. Pauline, you're stuck again. <laughs> Oh, no. Okay, you're back. Good. Let's go on. Oh, God. <laughs> He's telling me it's a bit unstable right here. Okay. So, are you? am I okay now? Yes. Right. So, LGBT is a word that, um, I, I mean, an acronym, and we've heard that understands what it means. You know, there's lesbianism, gay, bisexual, transgender, and the queer and the questioning. So maybe take us through, if I as a parent, my child would ask me, or oh, I would be here, or just for me to know so that I can be able to equip my child when maybe he gets, um, you know, in school or even at, even at church or wherever, with, with their own peers, they will hear this, others will want to, to join that club. We are going to do this. We are going to do this. We will. Yeah, we are going to do this. Unfortunately, today. Yeah, but let's just go on. Take us through, Lydia. Yeah, let's start with LGBTQ. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, we are discussing this topic because this LGBTQ is right here with us. It's here in our country. It's not something that's happening far away in the US, in Europe. It is right here. We know even last year and I think the year before, the LGBTQ community came out 
and they were going to the courts and they wanted rights. And so we must talk about this. Um, as I shared earlier, I had been going to schools to talk to young people and it came out very clearly that some of them were already in, uh, in this behavior, uh, homosexuality, really, that's what it is. And so that's where we need to talk about it. It's in the movies that we watch. Um, I'm going to give you some homework. I need you to just type out, um, just go to Google and just say LGBTQ cartoons or LGBTQ movies or shows on Netflix or even Cartoon Network. They'll all come to you and you'll be amazed at how many shows have LGBTQ people. And why I believe they're doing this is because they want to psychologically condition our children. Imagine cartoons having LGBTQ people, you know. You think your child is sitting there and just watching something entertaining, but in between this couple comes and there are two men or there are two women. And that is the reason why we really need to uh, get into this so that we can teach our children and they can be aware what the word of God says about this community. Um, again, you know, we have the internet, uh, our children have their phones, they have their smartphones, they have internet at home. As they are watching, something could pop up. Uh, again, to lure them and to teach them this kind of lifestyle, which we know that they should not engage in. Um, right here in Kenya, of course, you know, we have the gay community, we have uh, gay restaurants, gay bars, if you're not aware, they're there. We have, um, they, they even have uh, play, um, gay parties or lesbian parties. And it's our young children who are invited to go there. Um, if, if any of those uh, clips or posters have never come to your phone or somebody forwarding it to you, just know. I have seen one and I am certain that they are there. And I've also talked to young children, young teens um, who have been caught up in this uh, behavior. So I know, I know it's there. Um, I've talked even up to a, a, an 11 year old who told me her friend was already engaging. And so it's not too late to teach them and it's never also too early because in the countries abroad, they're even teaching their, their kindergarten children about lesbianism and you know, this whole LGBTQ um, issue. And so if you don't know what LGBTQ means, um, L stands for lesbian. Lesbian is basically a woman who's attracted to another woman. Uh, gay, gay is, it's really a person who's attracted to people of their own sex. Uh, you could use it interchangeably with the word homosexual, if you, if you, if you, if you may. And then bisexual, they're, they're really uh, attracted to whichever sex, whichever gender it could be. They could be attracted, it's a woman attracted to men, and she's also attracted to women. Then the transgender, um, these ones, they, they say that they differ with what they were assigned at birth. So if their parents saw, you know, saw their, their biological organs at birth and said, this is a male, now they say, no, I don't feel male. And these ones are, uh, it's come to a point where many of them are even going through medical changes, physical changes, surgeries. I think you've seen that on, on, on TVs or on shows. Uh, it's really a sad affair. Uh, we have one here in Kenya, I think she, he was called Andrew, and now he's called, he's called Audrey, and I think you, you saw his story. Um, they really change themselves, they even dress as women, if it was a man, you would see they are wearing wigs and makeup and high heels and dresses. Then there's queer, queer is really, um, they, they are saying they are really exploring themselves. They, some also call it questioning. They don't know which gender they are. But we know in the Bible that God created male and female. Male and female he created. And he created male and female so that um, we, are, we are either one of them. Um, there is no way you can be, you can say you don't know who you are. 
really you're either a male or a female and so the the the, the verse that i will uh, i will read for you to go with this we're going to read um romans 1 26 to 27 it says because of this god gave them over to shameful lust even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with, one, with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. And so the Bible is calling it a perversion. The Bible is also calling it unnatural. Okay, so this is how you explain it to your young people. Young people, if you're there listening to me, the Lord says that homosexuality is unnatural. And you can tell it is unnatural because how do two men have sex with one another? Of course, they're going to have anal sex, but that part of the body was not created to have sexual relations. And this can even affect them physically, infections and you name it, all kinds of uh, just destroying your own body. Mm -hmm. um, and so that if the Bible says it's unnatural, then it is unnatural. Another issue is that Sodom and Gomorrah, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuality, yeah? Uh, you can read that story in Genesis 9, 19 and you will see how the, the people in uh, Lot's life, the community where Lot lived, um, they wanted to have sex with the angels. And, and so um, this is, in fact, this is even how the word sodomy was, was created it's from Sodom, the word Sodom, um, because Sodom really what it means is Anal sex, and and so God destroyed the whole city. Uh, June one seven also goes back. This is in the New Testament. It goes back to talk about what God did, the punishment that they were given because of that. Another issue is um, the Lord Jesus. In the in he talks about marriage. And he talks about marriage in Matthew 19, 4 to 6, and many other places in the New Testament. And marriage, Jesus refers to it uh, about for male and female. He does not refer to it as two men being together or two women being together. Um, and he goes back into the book of Genesis and he says that um, God created male and female. And for this reason, a father, uh, a man leaves his father and mother and he's united with his wife and the two become one, one flesh, okay? So God, Jesus is talking about heterosexual relationships and not homosexual relationships. Another danger with this um, homosexuality is definitely it would lead to hellfire. It would lead to you missing heaven if you continue with that behavior. But if you confess it and you turn away from it, then you're safe. Um, and this you can read from 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. It lists a group of people who God says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And lastly, um, there, there is no gene gay gene. Uh, this is a study that uh, was done. It actually came out last year, around um, August 2019. Uh, there's a group of researchers who did uh, a research on, on, on homosexual people, basically. And they were trying to see whether they can retrieve a gene that caused them to behave the way they are behaving. And they did not find one. So really, it made me conclude that people choose that lifestyle. They choose it. They choose to become. They choose to get into that kind of community. So I'm going to end it here so that we can have enough time for the other topics. Wow. Wow. There is no gene for that. 
you know and i think that's where the confusion comes because we have had that um, discussion or you'd call it a debate that um, this was my this is my orientation this is how i am so there's it is a choice that people make that even young people would make yeah so thank you for quoting those um, scriptures because I think even as we talk to them about it, when and I think the, the main thing this afternoon is how do we use God's word? What scriptures? And you have mentioned quite a number of scriptures and our, I'm sure our viewers right now and even those who will listen in later will be able to follow. All right, now the sex. Remember, um, Lydia, I shared one of the reasons that um, we started this um, Sunday Teenage to Parent response or platform was basically because of the news about the teenage pregnancies, which had risen. And of course, pregnancy comes through sex. So we, there's, there's all that going around. And of course, parents encouraging one another and experts encouraging parents that we need to talk to our children about sex. So tell us, how do we go about talking about sex to our children through the word of God? Pauline, absolutely. We need to talk to them about sex. Because I, I realize that they actually don't know. When I, when I go to the schools and I, I realize that what they're taught in biology is just biology. But there's the real life. And that's what we need to talk to them about as parents. We need to teach them. We should not make an assumption that they know. Um, with all these pregnancies that have come out, we, we can actually tell that we went wrong somewhere, that we, we, we were not talking to them about it. Many of us, our parents who talk to us about it. It's a topic that we should not shy off from. Um, there's nothing to be shy about. In fact, when we shy off, then we, we, we put them in a situation where they learn from another source and that source would not be truthful. And that's how we are ending up having so many of, of, of these pregnancies. So let's, let's go into the word of God. Okay, so I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 6.18. It says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. I like this first word, flee, flee from sexual immorality. Teenagers, you need to flee. Fleeing means it's like you're running away from danger. For you, sex at this time is a danger to you. When you're grown up and you're married, sex is pleasurable to you and it is pleasing to God. And it is holy and it is sacred. So this is not your time to have sex. The Bible says flee, you run away from it. And the Bible says you're sinning against your own body when you have sex outside marriage. Okay, so what does this mean? What is your body? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's what the Bible says. First Corinthians 6.19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God, you are not your own. So your body belongs to God. So when you run into sexual immorality, when you run into, run into sexual sin, it is your own body that you're sinning against, the temple of God. Now, sexual intercourse. So when you have sex with someone, what happens to you is that you become one with that person. Why it is good in marriage to become one, even Jesus said it, the two become one flesh. It is good for the married man and woman to become one flesh because that makes them to be close to each other. It makes them, it, it, it actually connects them. They become intimate with another, physically, psychologically, emotionally, in every aspect. And that's what they should be. They're supposed to be one. And so it's good when, when it's in the marriage context. 
and God created it for them so that they can also create babies. You are created. Yeah. And so that is the purpose. At this time, are you ready to have a baby? How will you take care of that baby? You don't even not finish school. You don't have a job. You're not prepared in your mind to have a child. But you see the married, they marry actually also so that they can have children as God blesses them. So they're in the right place to have these babies, to have the sex and to have the babies. Okay? So what happens? You become one with this person you're having sex with. Yeah? This is 1 Corinthians 6.16. It says, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? Okay? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. So you unite yourself. You become one with someone who's not a husband. Oh, it's my boyfriend. He's not ready to marry you. You're so young. Uh, the time to do right now is to just have good friends, enjoy good relationships. And if you insist on being in a relationship, you must follow Christian dating relationships, which means you keep away from sexual contact, from petting, because all this petting and kissing, it's going to lead you to have sex because it will ignite the emotions and the feelings. So what's the point then to have relationships now? I, I normally tell them just do your best, keep off from them. Just have nice, good friends and enjoy good relationships with your peers, okay? So now when you become one with someone in that way sexually, you create something called a soul tie. I don't know if you've ever heard about a soul tie. You're emotionally and spiritually entangled and tied to this person. Whether you like it or not, it happens because sex is also spiritual. And so what happens in your future? You go and get married and uh, you start thinking of your old boyfriends. Uh, they start thinking of you, they're calling you. Then you put your marriage, in, your marriage in danger because you have carried that soul tie into your marriage. And that's, why, that's another reason why your parents and all of us grown-ups don't want you to be entangled into, into a sexual relationship, okay? So another thing, I, I also call it um, unholy sex because it's not blessed of the Lord. The only marriage, the only time when sex is blessed is again, as I've said, in the marriage context. That's when it is holy. That's when it is blessed. That's when God is pleased with it. And, and, and that's when it, it's perfect, okay? No fears of, oh, I'll get pregnant. If you get pregnant in a marriage context, it's a blessing. Okay? So if it's unholy sex, what happens to you? You're opening yourself up to, 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 to demonic entry into your spirit because it is spirit. Sex is spiritual. Another thing you're doing to yourself um, is there's an exchange of things, demonic things also. If that person has evil spirits, they will enter you because you've become one with them. So whatever they have comes to you, whatever you have goes to them. Okay? Another issue, what about the STDs? HIV infections? That could be your portion and we do not want you to lose your life. Um, and we do not want you to get sick or infected. Okay? They could have repercussions even in future. Infertilities could be brought about because of, you know, the STDs and everything. Then it could also lead you to think of abortions. Abortion is murder. Because even you yourself, if you were aborted, you wouldn't be alive here now. Today. You would have been murdered at that point when you're in your mother's womb. So abortion, it can lead you to think of it. Yeah, because you're afraid to have this child. Now you're pregnant. What am I going to do? 
you can say, oh, um, we are going to use condoms. As I told you before, the Bible has said, flee from sexual immorality. You sin against God, you sin against yourself, and you open yourself up into many things, even, even addictions uh, to sex, because you're not ready to be married at this time, okay? Then again, now you become, what if you become a young parent? It's so unfortunate. You yourself, you're a child, you're a teen, you're still growing up, your mind is growing up, your body is growing up. Then now you're trying to grow up a baby. Um, it's, it's a really unfortunate situation. Yeah, it brings a lot of pain to your parents, you know, or your caregivers. Then again, there's emotional pain that can come out of this whole drama of sex. Yeah, emotional pain. This same boyfriend you had today, two days later, you'll hear he has another one out there. What will you do with your emotions? How much pain is it going to bring to you? Okay, so much pain and even depression you know so if you're already entangled in it we would like you to we would like you to ask god first to forgive you and then walk with the lord i'm going to give you other points as we talk about pornography so that you can know how to get out of any sexual addictions if you're already in them but if you're not just continue to stay in purity sexual purity i'll stop wow. there <laughs> wow, Lydia, that, that was quite a bit ab about sex. And I think it's um, one of the major ones and um, the others are major as well. But I really like it. And what I like most, Lydia, is how you're actually talking like, you know, the way I should be talking to my child. You know, I like that you're talking like you're talking to a teenager. You know, how would a parent do it? You know, and I... I, I and I really like how it's really coming out. Yeah, so we are really learning a lot, Lydia. Take us through pornography. I'll take you through pornography. Actually, I'm yes. finding myself talking to, as though I'm talking to the teenagers because this is how I really talk to them. And I think yeah. uh, yesterday I, I told you, um, I, I had put this book together. It's called A Journey with Christ for Teenagers. At the moment, it's 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 an ebook, and I'll I'll let you know the link where you can send our parents to get it. Exactly. These are the things I really talk to them about. There are many topics, and and Pauline and I just chose these four because of mm. so that we can be able to discuss them within the hour. Mm. Um, so there are many other things that face our teenagers that I saw out there. It's my being out with them that. Um, the Lord allowed me to understand their issues and explain explain it to them using his word. Mm -hmm. So let's move to pornography. So the verse I want to use here is um, Psalm 101.3. It says, I will set no worthless, worthless thing before my eyes. Okay. Now, pornography, is, it's basically just people watching naked people or other people having sex. And really that is sin before God. And what really, what, what does to someone is, um, it introduces lust into the person's life. And um, this lust will introduce masturbation, it will introduce erratic sexual behavior just having different partners because already whatever you're watching you're watching different people you know in bed so the thought of having it with other people different people trying different people that's what you will become because you stop seeing sex as as a matter of an issue of love because sex is supposed to be also an expression of love between a husband and his wife, because they're reaching out to each other. And that's how, that's why God made sex the way it is. Yeah. He, he makes the men quick and the, the, the women not quick so that they can reach out to each other, love one another, kiss one another, hug one another, talk to one another, you know, before everything. 
so that it's meaningful, their bonding. But when you get into pornography, that's not the case. It, there's no issue of sex. Even, even the couples who use that as part of their marriage, it ceases. Well, I wonder, is it me? It ceases completely to be love. The other person becomes an object. How can I get to the end of this with this person? Because already your mind and your heart, they are not in the relationship and in the reaching out to the other person. Your mind and your heart are into the pornography and what those other people are doing and what you're getting out of it. So it ceases to become something that you're supposed to give. It ceases to be something that you're supposed to be giving to the other person and something that you're supposed to be receiving so that you can bond and love one another the way God intended it to be. Okay? So pornography is very addictive. And so the people who start getting into it, it in the beginning, it can look like child's play, but um, eventually um, it gets a hold of you because it preys on you. Pornogra pornography preys on its victims. It wants you to get addicted to it because it has a form of pleasure that comes with it, okay? So you need to watch out, yeah? What pornography does um, the, the, in this summary that I've, I've, I've put out, um, it makes you also become one with the people you're watching. Yeah, they are having whatever they're having, you're having whatever you're having, but your mind and your thoughts are with them and what they're doing and what they're making you feel. So you become one with them, yeah? Which again, we said you create soul ties um, which are not good for you. Another thing is you devalue yourself as you watch pornography, yeah? That's why it's done secretly People really don't know you're watching it. People don't know what you You close the door, you hide. Uh, you do it at night, in the middle of the night when people are not seeing you because you can tell. But if they find out that you're, you're watching it, it, they'll be so not happy with you. Yeah, so there's a form of devaluing. You devalue yourself when, when, you, when you get into it. Then of course it brings you last, as I've mentioned, it brings you you, you start to lack self-control, yeah? Because you keep wanting to get into it, to watch it, to watch it and watch it some more. Then again, uh, you turn sex into an object, uh, like an object, like it's not for love, it's just having, you know? And then it also makes your mind be attached to fantasies and uh, your thoughts, they become impure because the images stick with you. There's, 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 there's a guy who shared with us another day. He told us he saw when he was in high school, he was about 18 years old, and someone came with a, with a, with a picture of a, nude, uh, a naked woman. And he said when he saw it, that picture stuck into his head for a very, very long time. And so pornography has that effect. It can keep it, keep, those pictures can keep playing in your mind. So you'll keep having um, sexual fantasies, impure, impure thoughts in your mind, okay? So I have some more Bible verses. These ones are really to help people overcome that habit if they already have it, because God is there for us and he's there to set us free. Jesus came so that he could set us free. That is the fact. And there is power in his blood and in his name to set us free. So don't think, oh, I've gone too far. Oh, I'll never get out of it. You will get out of it. Just focus on the Lord. Focus on his word. Okay? So um, maybe I can just read two. This is Philippians 4.8. It says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, 
whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So really, God wants us to have a clean mind, a pure heart. It even helps you as a person to become a better person because you're not wasting your thoughts on useless things. Because really, this pornography, it can never help you. It would never be of help to you as a person. Okay? Um, this is Galatians 5.16. It says, so I say, live by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Okay? So that's self-explanatory. God wants us to live by his Holy Spirit. He is there to help us, to help us overcome addictions, to help us overcome dirty thoughts, to help us overcome behaviors that do not please God. So finally, and this one, I'll go through it very quickly. The, the, uh, these are just practical ways to stop pornography if you're in it. You can apply that with the sex, if you're addicted, you can apply that to homosexuality if you're addicted. So the first thing I put down is you feed your, your life with the word of God. Okay. Jesus said that his words, they are spirit and their life. There is no way you cannot apply the word of God in your life and you're not set free. Yeah. Secondly, uh, you keep yourself busy especially if you're a young person and you need to be busy. Boredom makes you want to be creative. Let me discover this. Let me look for this. Let me occupy myself with this because you're trying to fill up your idle time. Always make, make sure that you're busy. There are so many things to do in this life. Okay. Then three, build new habits. Okay. So that you, you can keep your mind away from curiosity. Four, be around people. I realize that this pornography, it wants to, it isolates you. Always keeping it, because you, you cannot watch it in front of people. So if you're with other people, other family members, you're mingling right now, we're in, we're in isolation, we're in um, quarantine, just hang around with your family members, play with your siblings, you know. Be, be in touch with people. Don't isolate yourself alone in your room. This can be a very tricky uh, thing for you to do because if you're already watching the pornography, you'll be tempted to put into it. So stay around people. Then recognize that Satan, he has traps. Yeah? And he wants us to fall into them. In fact, I was just thinking about that verse and um, that says that would be a lot that there's an enemy. He devours, he looks around for whom to devour. So don't allow yourself to be that person that the enemy will devour, that person that the enemy will pull into, into pornography, will pull into uh, alcoholism, drugs, and other uh, sex, you know, and other things that could uh, ruin your life. The other thing is, if you feel it's so hard, give up your phone, your smartphone, or just get the softwares that can block certain sites from coming into your phone. In fact, that's the most practical way to do it. There are many accountability softwares. Some, you, your parents have to sacrifice some money to buy them, but they're going to block all that in, in pornography or anything that's not good. You just select what you want, it will block out. The other way is to just have passwords and uh, you're accountable for which sites you're going into you know, and finally, I would again say the Holy Spirit, he helps us. He's with us. Jesus, when he left, he said, I'm sending you a helper. And that helper is the Holy Spirit. And he's present. He's with us. And for so long as you surrender to him, he will be there to help you. I'll stop there. Pauline, back to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lydia. Now, lastly, peer mm. pressure. Peer, peer pressure, yes. Okay, so now peer pressure, uh, I'll, I'll do it 
briefly. I am seeing like our time is gone. Yes, almost. yes, it has. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So peer pressure. Um, actually, uh, I, I was discussing with Pauline yesterday. You know, every stage of life, we all face peer pressure. You know, we must admit at some point, you know, ah, you feel some pressure to, to do what so-and-so is doing. Let me, you know, these people, they have done this. I need to do that, you know. So, so teens, peer pressure is there. It is there. But what we were discussing with Pauline was saying it can be positive and it can be negative. So keep away from the negative. Parents, we need to help them. We need to help our children keep away from the negative. The negative is so obvious. It has its fruit that comes with it. Yeah. Um, getting into alcoholism, cigarettes, drugs, you know, anyone teen who's taking you into risky behavior, that one is taking you into the negative side, which we don't want to see because we are very concerned about you. And we don't want you to live a careless life because we know what you're doing now will affect your future, okay? Uh, any, anything that's taking you from your schoolwork, you know, all that is negative. Anything that is dist distancing you from your family, it's negative, you know? If you have existing friends and now you don't want them anymore, you know, your parents can start to see that as a sign that there's other friends who are negatively influencing you and they'll have to find out, yeah? They are not doing it with a bad heart, but they need to know who's around you, who's around your life. Because, you know, you have peers in many levels. Some are from church, some maybe are from school, some are your neighbors, you know. So they want to know. They need to actually even interact with them. Um, Many teens tell me they fear parents. <laughs> they really fear parents. Other, they are friends' parents. Um, mm. they are not, yeah, your parents, they are really just concerned. They want you to have good friends who take you to good places. And uh, they want to see your behavior and your attitude is good. That even creates just a good, nice atmosphere in the house. And they would love having you around teenager. Yeah. So... Uh, really the negative, anything that is not favorable to, to you, teenager, anything that's not leading you to good things is, is negative. There's, there's one time I talked to a, a young teenager and uh, she told me that um, there's a time she went for a house party. She was a, around about 17 years old. She was invited for a house party. She was told uh, this party is for everyone who's going to join um, for first year at the university, so just come. And so she went, when she entered, um, she was shocked by what she found, um, that there were, there were drugs that were being served. And um, what is this drug called? Yeah, weed. And she was given a stock to take. And at first she was so shocked. She was like, no, I can't take this. And then she was told, everyone is taking. And so she took it and she took one, two puffs and she felt different. And so she put it out and she returned it to the person who had given it to her. And the person said, no, 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 just go, just go home with it. It's yours. So she went home with it and she started to take once a week, twice a week, and then it became an addiction. And so you see, this was a negative negative peer pressure and they were all doing it what she should have done she should have left that party there was no grown-up supervising um, and these parties uh, they are dangerous for you if you know very well then there are no grown-ups and these people who are gathering together they, they don't have an aim for their party they have alcohol and they have all these drugs you need to know quickly that that's negative peer pressure. Uh, positive peer pressure. Yeah, it's good. It's good because the teens want to feel a sense of belonging. They want to feel that they have people around them who are their age mates, you know, 
they want to feel confidence, you know, because when they're around them, they talk to each other. Um, they, they teach each other good things, yeah. That's how you know it's positive, you know. They, 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 they learn new hobbies that are good. Let's learn how to play an instrument, you know. Let's learn, you know, how to, how to study the word, you know. That's how you know positive things, you know. Um, so if your child is hanging out with people and they're turning out to, to be better, you know, then that's positive, positive peer pressure. You know, and those are the people you are allowed to hang around them. And the verse I had for this was Romans 12, 2. It says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So your peer pressures should always gravitate you to good things, to God, you know, to things that when you do them, you know, they're not sinful, you know, you're not practicing homosexuality, you're not encouraging each other to, to start having sex at, at a young age, you know, just things that are good and pleasing to God, you know, things that are in his perfect, perfect will. I'll, I'll stop there so that we can almost end wow oh yeah definitely we needed more and more time but i think for what you have put together for us lydia it, it's definitely a lot and i'm sure i'm benefiting many other parents are going to benefit as well and as i said i like the way you're bringing it out to us just as we are talking to a child listening to us so that's very nice and so yeah, we time is up and we only have time for a parting shot. And I would um, ask you to give a parting shot to a parent, one parting shot to a parent, one parting shot to a teen. Some parents have actually been telling me they've been watching the show even with their teens, you know? So talk to a parent and a parting shot to a teen. Okay, so really, um to the teens, as I'm, I'm saying it out to the teens, parents can also take it personally also for themselves, yeah? Because I'm, I'm really using the word of God. Okay, so, so, so teenagers, um, sometimes when I'm out there, I, I feel like some teenagers really feel a, a low self-esteem. I just want you to know that God knows you and he knows you by your name. This is Isaiah 43.1. He knows you. He knows you. Psalm 139 says that he knew you even before you were formed in your mother's womb. Imagine that. He knew you even before you were formed in your mother's womb. So God knows you. He loves you. He cares for you. And he wants you to have a relationship with him. That is the most meaningful relationship to have. Because as you have him, you're going to discover yourself. Because he created you, he created you with a purpose. And so you will discover yourself. As you're working with God, you discover yourself. And then you'll become everything you're supposed to be. You'll have a fruitful life. You'll have a joyous life. Yeah, and you will find your identity, your identity in Christ. Yeah, and no one will be able to take you away from him. In fact, I realize that people who get saved younger, they stay with the Lord. Even if they fall away, they always normally come back. That is a study that was done um, and it was shared with us in a certain meeting. Another issue that you should not feel lost in self-esteem, just know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made just the way you are, yeah? If you have a nose like mine, don't worry. You don't need to go anywhere to um, change it, yeah? Just be the way you are. God created you fearfully. He created you wonderfully. You are beautiful just as you are. Don't feel shy. Don't try to hide from people. Just be. Be who you are, yeah? Just be confident. Know that he created you. This is someone that in 13 to 16, it, is, it says... I praise you, Lord, because I'm fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. Okay? 
So don't worry about that. The other thing I want to share with you is your mind. I need you to take care of your mind. We shared one verse earlier. It was Philippians 4, 8. It says of the things that you need to think about. Okay? Anytime a thought comes into your mind, ask yourself, can I share this thought with somebody? If you can't, then that thought is not good. Okay? And you replace that thought with good thoughts. Okay? Uh, Proverbs 23, 7 says that as a man thinketh, thinketh in his heart, so he, so is he. So be careful with your thoughts. You need to think the good thoughts so that you become those thoughts. Because the Bible says what you think is what you become. Okay? Um, so think good thoughts, positive thoughts, yeah? Thoughts that will change your attitude towards life and things around you. So that even when your parents discipline you for something, just accept it. Accept that they want you to be a good person. Okay? Then another issue is your heart. Okay? The Bible says, guard your heart. This is Proverbs 4.23. Because everything you do flows from your heart. So you need to guard your heart. And that's why I was telling you pre previously about these relationships. <laughs> you could end up emotionally even hurting your heart so much that you go into a depression, you, you stop thinking of yourself, what you need to do, because your, your heart is aching, okay? So guard it, okay? Guard your heart, okay? Load up your heart with the word of God, the word of truth, okay? Another issue I want to tell you about, which I mentioned earlier, is meditating God's word, okay? The Lord says in Joshua 1, 8, um, that we should meditate on his word day and night and be careful to follow what is written in it and then we'll become prosperous and successful that is his word believe it okay and remember that god has a plan for your life that's um jeremiah 29 11 god has a plan for your life okay so finally let me finish this i won't um won't be able to go through all of it um, it's the, the power of your tongue, okay? The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 21, that this tongue, yeah, it has power. It has power over life and death. So you have to be careful what you're speaking. Don't speak hateful things to yourself. Oh, I can't do this. Oh, I, I messed up here. Oh, I did this. No. Start now to change your tongue to speak good things over yourself, over your life, what you want to become. And it's going to happen because the Bible says in that verse that and those who love it will eat its fruit. So something will come out. A fruit will come out. As you speak life to yourself, life will come. As you speak good things to yourself, good things will come. Okay. And we want to, uh, finally, I want to tell you, even together with the parents, that the Bible says that we are not fighting flesh and blood. We are fighting principalities and powers of darkness. What really that means is that the enemy, um, he tries to target us. And there's warfare going on in the spirit realm concerning our lives. And so the Bible says for us to overcome that, we should put on an armor. The full armor of God. You're going to read it in Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. This armor is really to protect us. From whatever the devil brings our way, we are ready, we are armed, and we bar him out, out of our lives. And always remember to pray. Parents, always pray for your children. Don't assume. Pray for them. Love them. They want to feel loved. And this love includes disciplining them, okay? Because even the word says, if you don't spank them, if you don't discipline them, if you spare the rod, and I'm not saying at their teen mood you need to spank them, but there are things you can take away from them. There are some privileges, privileges. you can take away from them. Mm. Keep that in mind, praying, loving them, disciplining them, and teaching them the values that you want to see in them and do your best and be an example to them because they look up to you as well and so everything we have discussed make it practical for them
So let me stop here. God bless you. And wow. Hope I'll see you soon. I hope you <laughs> Definitely, yes. Thank you, Lydia. You had quite a lot for us, and we are really happy. But thank you for bringing it out, bring it out so powerfully and in a good way. Today, it was all about that Jesus is the answer for the world today. I mean, if we use his word as parents, as teenagers, you've had it for yourselves. I think we're gonna, it, it's gonna be a better world and we can create a better world by using the word of God. So thank you very much, Lydia. It was a pleasure hosting you. Thank you for being here. And I'm going to post for our viewers the link to the ebook and also the other books which I had earlier posted to them, but I'll still do it on this broadcast so that they can get those books and read them even for the younger children. Thank you, Fiona, our sign language interpreter. From all of us here, the teens to parents and teenagers to parents platform, we want to wish you a good week ahead. God bless you and God bless Kenya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Fiona. Okay.